Matt, uh, scientist. Uh, welcome to the embedding. Just a lay of the land here. Uh, who has used word embeddings before? So maybe a third of the people. No. Coming into the talk. That said, we're going to build up to some, you know, more advanced stuff pretty fast. So if you've never used them and you don't know what this is all about, um, feel free to interrupt me, ask for questions. If I go too fast, you can stop me. Um, so embeddings are a way to turn normally discrete objects into vectors of numbers. The most common. words are not numbers so having a way to turn words into numbers is nice because then you can shove those numbers into your model and that helps prediction There's obviously if you just look at information out in the internet words are a lot of that information so being able to process that is pretty useful to anyone um, that said, there's plenty of other uses apart from words. Uh, anything that's a discrete object, you can probably turn into an embedding somehow if you're crafty enough. When you're taught about machine learning, they mentioned that clustering is unsupervised learning and that they never talk about it ever again for the rest of the school. Uh, that's actually not is probably so it's one place where there's a big gap between actual practitioners and uh, you know at least what people thought undergrad and grad school um, in 2013, when word -to -vec came out, probably everyone who reads data science blogs has heard at least about word -to -vec. Um, Arguably, word -to -vec launched NLP into a new golden age, which we're arguably still into right now. Um, so before we jump into the deep, to the classic demo everyone does for word embeddings, because our words are now vectors of numbers, we can do all sorts of math stuff on them. Like first of all, uh, if we take this word to vec and we embed, you know, common words like grass, concrete, and we have them on a coordinate. So first of all, we can cluster them, and you know, one thing you'll see is that the words are related to power tools sort of cluster together. The word related to kitchen appliances sort of cluster together. This is because uh, try to get words to be close together. Um, that also means that we can do algebra on words. Uh, obviously, you can do al algebra on vectors so that you can do this directly on the words too. So the classic example everyone sees is uh, if you have a question like France is to Paris as Russia is to X. So Russia would be, uh, X would be Moscow in this case. You can reorganize that into a little formula like Paris minus France plus Russia equals X. Um, I can actually, like, if you just take an up the shelf model, I, I don't know if we can zoom in a bit. So, this is just a little notebook I, I for uh, walking into here. It takes literally one second. You import the GenSim library, which is a helper. Thanks. Uh, you load an off model on Wikipedia. And then we do this. So if we have France is to Paris as Russia is to X, we can reorganize this in algebra as Paris minus France plus Russia is our answer. We can reorganize this again as Paris plus Russia minus France equals X. So we just do this formula, uh, most similar positive. Uh, so Paris plus Russia minus France. And the most similar answers are going to be uh, Moscow, Kiev, Kremlin, Petersburg, Russia, and Tokyo, etc. Uh, we can do similarly like king minus man plus woman. The answer would be queen. If you take a king, you remove the man part and you add a woman part, that would be a queen. And the answers are queen, monarch, throne, princess. So it's sort of getting getting the idea, obviously. Like the first one, those are you know pretty clean examples where the semantics are very obvious. Um, yes.
vaguer answers, right? So the number you see next to this is like the score of like how close you are to your answer. And obviously the, these ones, like the concept of man and woman is very clean in the model because that's something that comes up a lot in English just because of how English. Uh, same thing with the uh, Paris and because those concepts appear together. If you start straying from it, you're going to get lower. Always get answers this clean. That's it. You're going to generally be pointing in the direction looking for, um, especially with bigger, newer models. Let me just find my mouse cursor. Actually, there. That little live demo sort of broke the flow of the, sorry about that. Oh, no, 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 I, I just wanted to get back into the points. Okay, um, so let's talk about training those uh, embeddings. So I, I said before that the model I downloaded was Let's just think about all of Wikipedia. So you download all the files, you shove them into one gigantic, you know, terabyte long file, and that's your training data. Um, what we assume is a distributional hypothesis, which is that uh, together uh, we assume our Um, so we can arrange all the sentence as a rows in a matrix where the columns is just an indicator uh, in a one hot sense of literally every single word in the English language. And the rows would be um, You can transpose this if you're handy with your linear algebra, just by multiplying the matrix you have here off Wikipedia with the transpose, that's gonna put the words on the columns and the words on the, uh, uh, on the rows and on the columns. And because you multiplied it with itself, it's just gonna be basically how often the words appear. So the diagonal is gonna be the word with itself, so it's how often the word appears on Wikipedia. And then the cross, uh, the cross checks here is gonna be how often a word appears with another word in a sentence. And this is going to be basically our numeric for words. At this point, we already have some of words. It's just unwieldy and uh, you can't actually do this with Wikipedia without crashing your computer, but we have a mental model of it. Um, so that means we have a medical structure over the text. Uh, you can think of it, one, as the matrix I just talked about, or two, as a big graph or network where words that appeared in sentences have an edge connecting them, and the edge also has a weight that represents how often they appear together. And then each word is going to have, you know, weight on itself, which is how often it appears at all uh, on Wikipedia. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're not actually the same like on the slide. It's just like a visual example. Is that what you're saying? Like that, the, yeah, the matrix and the graph there are not, yeah. Sorry about the being misleading there. It got lost in making the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The matrix should be perfectly symmetric here. Like, uh, because like this should be the same as that and that should be the same as that one there. Uh, and same there. Uh, if it's not symmetric there, it's just because I hacked it out in two seconds. Uh, but yeah, you should have a symmetric matrix of how often things appear together. This thing is exactly the same thing, just in our head as a mathematical object, as a graph of like the relation of words, how often they appear in sentences together in your training data. Yep. We don't think about punctuation right now. Just like you split, you know, a sentence as a row. You can, you can think that the punch, punctuation mark is like a word, and just count, you know, the question mark as a word itself, or you can just throw it out. It's up to you. 
modern systems take them as words or they actually do even fancier stuff than that. Um, so yeah, one way to think about the embedding and probably the way to think about it is that if we have the matrix with uh, the words on the rows and columns here, just do dimensionality reduction directly on it, you know, scalar and dot dimensionality reduction on the matrix. Boom, you reduce the number of columns. So each row is going to be one of the words in the wiki. And then you have a set of columns, and that's just your vector. Your vector is the row here, right? So the number of dimensions is like pre set. Um, if you're training data and everything fits in memory, that's a perfectly fine thing. If you use some of the uh, like Leland Mechanis, I think, presented here before, and he has one dimensionality reduction library called UMAP, which actually does this excellently for anything that fits into your computer correctly. Um, so I recommend that. Um, another way to think about that if you have a graph there, then you're actually destroying all the edges in the graph and just putting the graph's nodes on a coordinate system now, right? Obviously, a 100 dimensional coordinate system, but it's still the same thing. So instead of having direct hard relations, you have soft, loose relations between your nodes now. Uh, this is going to be important uh, in, a, in a moment. We need to think about embedding as both dimensionality reduction on a matrix and destroying the structure from a graph and into a loose st structure at the same time because both things are happening at once and uh, if you forget one of the two concepts you can get lost sometimes when you're working into harder stuff um okay why did it take until 2013 to become useful obviously all that math is not that complex and it could be like 98 uh the reason is that obviously fitting the matrix i was talking about from the whole of wikipedia expose your computer and to get actually good word impact The VEC was the first one that popularized it. Uh, it's a very, very small neural net that takes a sentence as an input and tries to predict the word from the context. It has only one middle layer, basically. And so the middle layer is smaller than the average length that you're going to have. So it forces an encoding. And then you just pick up that layer for any words. And that's going to be a representation. And since you can do this sentence by sentence, you can actually stream in the data. And that lets you work that larger scale than trying to work on an actual matrix which needs to fit somewhere in some memory stick. Um, there are other methods than word of vec obviously, but that's the first one. Questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. So what happens if in your training data you have like one word that you use to compute the description? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, the the question is, what happens if a word has multiple meanings? Uh, that has a technical term. It's called polysemy. We're gonna talk about it at the very end of the presentation. In a naive way that you're gonna see there. So the word is gonna be like is that you start with a randomly initialized, you know, set of words. There. Okay, there you go. And then those words that appear together get closer, and words that don't appear together get clustered apart just over time, right? So between the two. Talk about before, which is food, then it's going to include both of those meanings. Uh, that, that can be a problem, especially for questions like he asked for. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about embeddings that are not uh, related to words. Uh, so let's say you have a network, like the actual. Obviously, same thing as 
and says that simple. Uh, let's say you have uh, your actual, you know, Facebook or Instagram social network. And then you can word the vector. So that, that means that for any node in your social network, you now have embedding. So you have a structure instead of a hard structure that's basically impossible to work with. Now you have some just a vector of 300 numbers and you can also develop uh, this scores, everything like that. Um, obviously, if your network fits into your computer, uh, you can use Node to Vec on it, but you can also use just simpler stuff, right? You can represent your network as a matrix, use UMAP on it or something like that. If you have questions, you can ask me after. Uh, let's go over a live example. Uh, this is the Instagram Explore page. Um, so obviously, there you click on explore on the Instagram app. Uh, it's filled up with uh, output of a recommendation algorithm. So they have a random that says what you're most likely to like, and that fills it up from you know left to right, top down. Uh, let's go over the architecture of the uh, actual algorithm. Uh, this is the this is, uh, the algorithm's al architecture from Instagram engineering directly. Uh, what they have is first of all, you'll notice uh, they use the viewer the author, so the viewer is the person who clicked on Instagram Explorer. The author is the person on the other side producing the content, and then the image. Uh, those are the three parts. For both the viewer and the author, the most important feature set is just the embedding of that person. And the way they do those embeddings is directly note the vec from the Instagram social network. So most of the Instagram Explorer, the embedding of you, in the Instagram social network, the embedding of uh, most of what the neural net down the line is going to do is mostly a similarity score. You know, how related are they? And then you have a couple of features from like the actual image itself, a couple of features from you know interactions and and you shove this downstream and you have a recommendation system. So this is actually used in production. Uh, anyone who works with a, a network either should use this or is already using it. Um, okay, so just a quick recap. We're embedding. So, sometimes you just need numbers. Things are for you. Um, second thing is that, you know, continuous real numbers are better than integers for things. One of the at least you, you should like sort of get that concept eventually, is that doing optimization over discrete objects is really hard, right? Uh, one of the first things you see is like, oh, here's the traveling salesman problem. And be hard and like people dedicate their how to optimize that. And you're like, well, at least personal things. On the other end, we have like these massive, you know, neural networks with hundreds of layers and and those trains in like very fast because they have gradients, right? And gradient descent is the best tool for optimization that exists. So if you can replace an integer optimization, you're gonna have is uh, sometimes fast and compact approximations are better than slow and large exact solutions. So if you have a huge network or some big structure that you can't really work with, then you can just do away with the structure and work with the embedding approximation of it. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, you know, high level concept, uh, trains, Barely need a train driver. On the other hand, uh, the structure for the road network is pretty bad. Uh, if you've talked with anyone who works in self-driving, with uh, 
uh, their own network, like sometimes things are painted, sometimes they're not. And so you can't really work to automate the structure of their own network because the structure itself is just not conducible automating. So what we do with self-driving cars instead uh, is that we use LiDAR, we use camera sensors, and then we take decisions based on our best guess. So doing away with the structure is the only solution to some problems. Um, yeah, uh, another example you're going to have is, uh, you know, text translation. We're going to translate the text to an embedding, and then we're going to decode that embedding into the other language. So doing away with this working in higher level math lets us jump from language to language. Um, okay. Uh, the math behind embeddings, uh, I can slow down. By the way, I'm, I feel like I'm going very fast. Uh, everyone's good? Okay. So under the hood, um, so we have, these are word embeddings, and just instead of being represented as numbers, uh, the words, uh, the numbers here, like each little cell is a number, right? So they're, I think, 50 or 100 long, those word embeddings for all of these. And uh, the color is just the number. So one. So if it's very dark blue, it's uh, closer to one. If it's very dark red, it's closer to minus one. Um, so we have a bunch of related people, queen, woman, girl, boy, man, king, queen, and then we have the word water. Um, one of the first things I want you to notice is, uh, look at this over here. This is all blue for everything that's related to people. We jump to unrelated word water, uh, it turns off. For some reason, water is related in this dimension to everything else. We can't really know what those are, but this dimension is probably related to peoplehood, right? Uh, similarly, the fourth dimension, dark per person, uh, yeah. You have this dimension here that for a woman, girl, boy, man is uh, very hotly encoded, but for queen and king is much cooler. So this probably does not encode the, the concept of like monarchy but it does uh, embody like the concept of uh, personhood. Obviously, these are all guesses, right? Um, uh, I come from econ e economics, and the old joke there is in economics, nothing never works, but we know exactly why. And in computer science, it always works, but we're just guessing why, right? And this is completely guessing why, right? And we're sort of making guesses, but you know, at least it works. Um, if we look at the algebra we did earlier, so we have, you know, a king minus man plus woman. So if you have king, man, woman, then you're gonna you're gonna come up with something that's sort of close to queen. Uh, so before, right? Like king minus man plus woman is not exactly queen, but at least like the dimensions I was talking about earlier, sort of something that points in that direction, right? And like I said, if you actually go look directly under the hood, uh, what you see is that some, some of the numbers dimensions actually points to higher level human concepts. Um, so we use what's called the cosine distance to look at the relation between two vectors uh, before. And uh, this is basically the angle between two vectors. So I don't want to go too deep into advanced math, but geometry and uh, vectors are related. And um, vectors are considered uncorrelated if they agree to each other. Correlation between vectors are actually complete math. Uh, so when you train something like a word to vec model, uh, the statistical pattern separates into what we call principal, and those are the exact dimension in uh, the, the, and those will agree to each other. Uh, we can't guarantee that like, you know, if you think about the vector that we had before where you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fifty 50 numbers, we can't guarantee that like, you know, the first number, so the, the X axis literally is going to be literally the concept of personhood. And then the second one is literally going to be the concept of like aggression or something like that. But we can guarantee that they're at 90 degrees to each other. So they might be rotated, right? So you might have two of the, any two of the dimensions together, which uh, if you rot rotated them in a way, you would have at least one and the other that, that form what we call a basis vector. So like a, an actual axis, uh, which represents a, a meaning. So, 
That's just because the stati statistical patterns of the words uh, in the sentences, um, yes, yeah, so they, 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 they actually separate out when you train these things. Um, I'm not sure if I was clear. Are there questions? So, yeah, we're good. Yes? Uh, yeah, we'll go into that later. It's good to, you know, normalizing your vectors is like washing your hands after going to the bathroom. I, I recommend. So, <laughs> that said, you can work with raw, unnormalized vectors, but we'll go into that in a minute. Yes. 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 Yeah. Well, first of all, matrix we were talking about before on the diagonal, the, the diagonal value of that word, if it's a why we use the cosine distance because if you have a thing like the right. And the diagonal in your matrix is going to be massive. So the length of the vector is going to be very, 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 very long, right? So you can't guarantee that like, um, a naive, you know, distance metric between two vectors would be like, right? Which is the distance between here and here. That would not work because the is all the way over there. And a, a word like architecture is going to be somewhere here, right? Uh, this is why we use the angle between the vectors. Right, based on the theory that things that are meaningful, you know, are going to our principal components of the word like the, the fact that it appears often and everywhere is not going to bias the or bias some other like less smart metrics that you might use. Does that help? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, some tips and tricks. I'm actually going really fast, so feel free to, to, to stop me for more questions anytime you have. Uh, first of all, testing your embeddings. Um, you train, test, and you feed the output of that model. It's probably going to you know, be used by every other. Um, but you should test them, right? You can't just train it. Uh, like the testing has a quality, but uh, any unsupervised. I should plug my laptop. Sorry. Anything unsupervised is inherently hard to test. Uh, you don't have you know labels, so you you can't get a test set and then you know do. Um, so the 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 most common you're going to see people test their embeddings is actually handcrafted test sets. So if you have like word embeddings, then you can, you know, pick out uh, you can look at graph relationships. So if Uh, that person minus me should equal like the rest. You can try relationships, like the thing with France and Paris and Moscow that I did before. You can just get a, get a big list of those and just try algebra to see like this the algebra, right? It's similar to synonyms, but it's testing much harder because we're trying math on it. Um, you can also try clustering. You train your embedding model uh, and then you throw. First test uh, is uh, you take Wikipedia in English and Wikipedia in Spanish, and then you mix them and you train all of it. Then Spanish words. Cluster completely apart. Completely separate graphs in the same super graph. Um, and then the very lazy way, which I tend to do, is. And 
your initial plan was to use word embeddings to augment your conversion rate model, then just don't think about that conversion rate model and look at um, Okay. Uh, second point. Uh, friends don't let friends take distance metrics without first normalizing. That was your point. Uh, <laughs> so you don't. We're working when we're doing these on uh, a notion of math that's called a metric space, where you need to first define a metric. So, like I said, you know, taking vector distance is not necessarily smart because maybe it was. So. If you normalize everything to you, then for a good reason. The math between making everything add up to unit length vectors means that Euclidean distance, the dot product, and the cosine distance are all the same thing. So you just do whatever, and now you're taking the angle, which is good for reasons that Alex was talking about. And it's vector distance, and it's also the dot product, which is very fast. So boom. Uh, done. Uh, however, normalizing destroys some. Uh, like he said before, uh, common words are going to have very long vectors in the raw embeddings. So that actually encodes some information that you lose at the normalization stage. So what I recommend is that if you're just using this tasks, like a neural network, then having a batch norm layer somewhere towards the top of the neural net is going to be for you and you think about it. That said, if you're doing fancier stuff, then you need to think about where and how you're normalizing. Uh, okay, next, aggregating embeddings. So let's say we have it's like I ate a turkey and you want a vector representation of that sentence. Um, the simplest uh, way, and this is actually what I recommend if you just have this problem and you want to solve your problem, is you take the average of the sentence you're done. Um, yes. Oh, um, people used to do that. Nowadays, they don't so much anymore. Um, we'll go. Ngram embeddings and aggregating those was the hot thing, uh, not so much. That's an, like maybe it has some uses that I'm not aware of. Everything in NLP, right? So um, like people did that, so there's clearly some merit to using ngram embeddings, yes. And also like a thing that people did and still do is uh, separating you know, things that are important in English language like ing. Um, if you have enough data, you can also just train walking and walk separately. Um, okay. Uh, so aggregating embeddings, uh, it's the, the most useful when you have groups of things. So if you have a sentence and you want to aggregate it, or um, if you have yourself in put in this uh, line of work. So any function that takes a matrix and outputs a vector is fine, right? Average sum. Um, however, you probably want to use weights. Uh, like if you have uh, the word the, you know, a lot and the word uh, a lot, the more text you're going to embed, the more you're going to uh, tend towards like uh, an embedding that's just like a soup of the average of everything, which starts losing meaning. So you want to use weights to downplay the words that don't matter. And, uh, TFIDF or just term frequency or just inverse document frequency are all good options. Think about what you're doing before you start, you know, using weights. Um, don't just naively throw weights at your problem. Um, another thing that's uh, cool is uh, principal components. So if you've never seen them, like principal components are the 
the basis back there is that uh, we can trace all data, basically. Uh, they, they, they are meaningful. As we saw before, things separate out at 90 degrees to each other. So if you have you know, a list of sentences and you get the embeddings, then you can treat this as a matrix, right? If you look at the first principal component of that matrix, that's going to be the common theme in all those sentences, right? So a smart thing like the sentences, um, but you want them to from each other. You could put all of your sentence embeddings in one big matrix, right? So you aggregate all the words in every sentence. Every sentence is one embedding. Put all of the sentences in one matrix. Um, by Sanjay Aurora, uh, 2017, called a simple but tough to beat baseline for sentence embeddings, which is basically that. And it's extremely well compared to like much fancier stuff using like BERT and Elmo. Um, just word embeddings, use smart weights between the words when you aggregate the sentences. And if you have a bunch of common corpus of text, you can take out the first principal component. And that means that your outputs of the sentence embeddings are much denser with information. Um, so the image there is uh, just like a project I, I did a while ago, like a weeknight thing. I just script all of uh, a bunch of I just aggregate in embeddings from like the lyrics, the sentences, the songs, the actual artists, right? And, uh, I put, you know, all the, so the, the cool thing is that we actually see French and English. Right? So the island here is a bunch of French rappers. And here you have, uh, you know, English rap, rock, all sorts of stuff. Uh, over here you have uh, some separate, like, I think it's country or something like that. But you actually literally see the language separation, right? Uh, French very clearly separates in a different island than English for reasons that are pretty should be clear to anyone who's listened up to this point. Um, that's a problem though, because if you have the word sh and the word cat, maybe you want them to actually point to exactly the same place, right? Maybe, maybe you don't want French to be separate from English, right? If people are talking on multiple languages, on whatever you're you're working with, and you want actually like the the meaning of the words regardless of the language. There's actually a pretty cool trick for that, and uh, don't need to do much because you can just look at Facebook's Muse library, which is on GitHub, and has uh, where you know words in exactly the same place. If you want to do do it yourself, it's actually not that complex. You get a big corpus of translated text. You train word embeddings in both languages. And you train matrix in between the two to actually align the embeddings of the, the, the languages, right? So you have a matrix in the middle afterwards once you're done training that you can multiply any embedding by and it's aligning. If I didn't go too fast, it's a pretty clever trick. Um, so like I said, Mute has it trained already for you because it's pretty long to train between things, which is already ungodly long. It is also very long. Download Facebook's Muse. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, the last thing, and it's probably the, the one you've read the most about if you follow the language model uh, embeddings. BERT is the most famous right now. Um, probably, probably don't need BERT whatever you're doing. If you do need BERT, you probably know what you're doing and you don't need to listen to me anyways. Okay, done. Um, BERT solves the problem of polysemy that you, uh, you were talking about and uh, it gets con what we call con contextual embeddings. So what that's going to help you with is getting a different embedding between this word and that word, right? Uh, the way it does this is that it's an actual language model. So it's a full neural net that creates Context, and then you just for the word. So as you input things, because it's an RNN, the state in the network is going to change. So if you hit turkey after I8A, 
the embedding is going to be different than if you hit Turkey after I ate a turkey in the country of uh, this uh, architecture. You, it takes sentences uh, and then it predicts a masked word given the sentences context, like I said before. Um, if you do need it, uh, it's a pain to work with to actually get embeddings out of. But that said, uh, it does beat uh, baseline scores and it's state of the art on a lot of uh, you know classic academic NLP tasks. So it's very good at what it does, even though it's so if you do need it, then that's birth. It's best in class. Uh, that's it. So if you have questions, uh, if you need. NLP or something like that, I'm open. 